You're listening to the World Cafe. I'm Talia Schlanger. So you hear a lot of different types of music on this show, right? But today's guest, well, I am willing to bet you've never heard anything quite like her. Her name is Tanya Tagak. She's collaborated with Bjork, and she's won Canada's prestigious merit-based award, the Polaris Music Prize. Here's a little taste of what Tanya Tagak sounds like. That's a piece of Retribution, the title track off Tanya's latest album, and all the vocal sounds you hear there are made by Tanya. They're based on her interpretation of Inuit throat singing, an ancient tradition that was originally performed as a friendly competition between two women in the North. Tanya and I talk about how she brings that tradition to punk and electronica. Tanya herself is Inuk. She comes from Cambridge Bay, Nunavut, a remote community of about 1,500 people in northern Canada. She spent time in a residential school, and if you don't know what that means, well, it is a tremendously dark part of contemporary Canadian history. Tanya will explain what residential schools were and their devastating effects. She's a proud and passionate advocate for First Nations rights, which shows up in her music and in our chat. We're going to talk for a bit before she performs. Now listen to the way Tanya speaks in conversation, how calm, warm, and gentle her voice is. And then get ready to be totally startled when she performs about halfway through, how her voice becomes visceral and powerful. It is really something. Ready? Here we go. Tanya Tagak, uh, so happy to have you. Welcome to the World Cafe. Thank you. It's so awesome to be here. Yeah, we're really pleased to have you. So you hail from uh, from Canada, from Cambridge Bay, none of it originally. Mm-hmm. And for people who have never seen a picture or been there, um, can you paint me a picture of what the land looks like? Um, well, Cam- none of it's a huge expanse. It uh, goes from one end of the continent to the other uh, above the Arctic Circle. So it's 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 huge. So there's a very wide variance of um, topography and h- how how the land looks like there's mountain ranges in some area but some areas where i'm from in cambridge bay it's it's flat and there's no trees because it's above the arctic circle and the sea ice is thick sometimes 10 feet thick and uh, 24 hour sun in the summer wow 24 hour darkness in the winter for three months at a time so really the year is like a long day so it's it's beautiful and it's very harsh and it's very uh, pristine yeah and what's the community like up there are there a lot of people around you is it a very tight-knit sort of um, space well there's um, a series of communities spreading spread across Nunavut and there's small small towns ranging from the largest one around 10,000 approximately and the smallest one you know when I was growing up Brown Sound I think there's 30 people there Wow! but um, the government really wanted us in community so that Canada could claim the Northwest Passage right so we were basically forced into communities but they're, they're small communities and you can't there's no roads obviously, because it's across the Arctic Oceans, like you can't really drive from one to another. Mm -hmm. So it's super isolated. And it's the more the feeling like the land owns us than we own the land because there's such a vast expanse surrounding us and we have to uh, fly by jet from community to community. So you learn a lot of really beautiful things like... uh, how how to accept and accept each other properly and tolerate each other and also there's a, a huge lack of pretense because you can pretend to be something but your actions are who you are so everyone in the community knows who you are you can't pretend to be a good person or you can't hide your flaws so people are a lot more open and it was a huge culture shock when I first went south. Mm. I got in a lot of trouble. (laughs) I got in trouble. Okay, what kind of trouble did you get into? Uh, Well, there was a few things that happened when I first went down to Halifax. Where, yeah, number one, it was a social thing where I I didn't understand... If you know, if you're gonna if if you're gonna be snaky, you have to be able to stand behind it. Like if you're gonna lie or if you're gonna be in my face, you're typically 
And again, I don't want to speak for all Inuit, but typically you better be able to back that up, right? So, And that's a th segment of society I never quite understood. And as I traveled, I got used to it. Like, you know, when I was living in Spain and I heard somebody like insult the other person, like, oh, I hope your mother dies of cancer or something. And it's like, you say that in Nunavut, you're getting your ass kicked, right? So here I was in, uh, oh... I was so angry. Here I was in, in Halifax, like kind of being faced for the first time with this idea where I had to let people mistreat me in a way I wasn't used to. And sometimes I would, you know, react in violence, basically. Really? I was kind of a kicker, yeah. <laughs> Like yeah, throwing yeah, fists. Yeah. Well, yeah, and it's uh, like I've learned. I've kind of learned the hard way not to, not to do that anymore. But like it's, it's sometimes difficult for me, bec and because it's a thing where people don't. It's a cultural thing, like socially, like you know, if you're in a room with a bunch of people. And you bring in your stressy pollution and being angry and upset about small things, that affects the psyche of everyone around you. So typically Inuit won't stir that pot unless it's something really, really important because living harmoniously is a priority. So when somebody's purposely kind of agitating everyone, there would be a confrontation and not necessarily a physical one, but there would be a confrontation. And also, like, I grew up, you know, more connected to nature. So I don't, I couldn't understand this mentality of, like, um, being ashamed of your body, like, a, like, like that your breasts or something wrong with your breasts, right? And, of course, there I was, like, 19 and so proud of mine. <laughs> I was like letting the letting the flag fly so hard. I got kicked out of my dorm. Um, <laughs> I almost got kicked out of my dorm, and <clears throat> I just didn't understand why people had to have all these rules surrounding sex. Like, say, I remember um, being up at home, and it's a twenty-four hour darkness, and there's nothing to do for three months. And you're sitting there with your best friend and you've watched five movies in a row and it's minus 55 outside and you're like, oh, well, I want to get it on. And it's like, OK, like it's there. Can <laughs> and then because it's a small community, inevitably, when two people break up, they're going to eventually start dating people, you know. So you learn how to um, just kind of deal with each other socially in a different way. And there's just so many different rules. Right. So I didn't understand why. Uh, I was supposed to be ashamed of my body or or ashamed of any um, sexual encounters I may have have run into. So I think that in my dormitory, people just didn't know how to handle me. And I was so I had a lot of energy back then. Like I was kind of uh, just getting in trouble. And I remember going to a park uh, in Halifax and sitting on the park bench and there were a bunch of ducks like around my feet and you know you spend your whole life you know watching people hunt these things or hunting these things and it's like just little things like i'd want to snap one's neck and bring it home you know stuff like this that was that's like completely culturally associated so those were some of the ways i got into trouble we're going to hear you uh, perform for us, and it would be reductive to say that this is Inuit throat singing um, because it's many things, mm -hmm. um, and the sound is so rich, and, and the vocal range that you have is spectacular. But one of the roots, I guess, of the sound that we're going to hear is in the tradition of throat singing. Would you um, explain to me where that comes from and, and what it is? Absolutely, and thank you for asking, because w w we've been grappling with this for a while, because... Uh, who I am is so attached to my culture, being born and raised up there in Nunavut. And, you know, I'm Inuk and my father, my mom's Inuk, my father's English. <clears throat> and throat singing is a thousands of years old tradition that is a call and response, friendly competition between two women. Like it, it's a very, very endearing and technically super difficult. And this is part of a, the root of what I do, but it isn't what I'm, it isn't traditional, not even close 
to being traditional. So sometimes I wonder if I should be called a throat singer. And technically I am throat singing, but I also am a, I'm a vocalist. Exactly. Like, like you know, I, yeah. I'm, I explore all the range of my voice and I don't adhere to the the rules surrounding traditional throat singing at all. Like I sing alone and it's uh, improvised and I don't harness any particular sound or pattern. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes within my community, there's people that are saying, like, you shouldn't call yourself a throat singer. And I grapple with it because I am throat singing, but and I'm not trying to represent an entire group of people, but I'm so... I'm so inuk. You know, like how do I how do I move back and forth with this? Because if I just said vocalist, people might not grasp um the the sounds that are coming I I think from the land, you know, from my background. How did you um like coming from the isolated space that you mentioned and thinking about um the tradition of two women playing this um sort of uh, loving challenge vocal game with each other. How did you take those bones, that those basics, and turn them into what you do? Like, when did that idea come to you? Well, this is a another a big topic that we don't. We, there's so many things we don't have time to talk about. Yeah. But, um, where my my family originates from is different from where I grew up. Where I grew up in Cambridge Base in the Central Arctic, and it was heavily affected by the residential school program. And for Americans who are hearing this and don't know what that what that is, would you just give us the basics? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's important that uh, if you're interested, just look it up. There isn't a lot of um, positivity that came out of indigenous children being ripped from our homes and brought to places where sometimes the death rate was at 75% and it, very harrowing experiences of um, our people where uh, we were, the government attempted to assimilate us and but through that process it was extremely abusive and very dangerous and there are mass graves and children were abused and unable to speak their language and sometimes not seeing their family for a decade and it, it was forced there was no choice so uh, I mean I don't like I said I don't have time to get into it too much I went to residential school for high school but it was uh, voluntary like I didn't have to go mm -hmm. so that was near the end the last residential school closed down in um, 1996 and the government is admitting between six to 10,000 children died, but it was way more. Like 150 children, or 150,000 children were ripped from their families, but I think the n number is actually closer to 50,000 that died. And, and w w like what time period is, is this? Like we don't think of Canada that way. Well, the, the, the last one closed in 1996. Yeah. Anyway, in Cambridge Bay, <clears throat> it was heavily affected by the residential school program and that includes uh, the, the direct result of that is um, uh, people coming back traumatized, you know, ab abused and that carrying on because when you break people, it's hard. It's like when the people go to war, right? You break them and it's hard for them to move forward. That in conjunction with um, our own judicial system being just dismantled and a foreign judicial system implemented made a, a terrible equation, but the, not a lot of people were speaking any Inunatun, and I didn't hear throat singing growing up. And that's particular to Cambridge Bay, Central Arctic. Like, I don't want to speak for the entirety of Nunavut because I know in other places throat singing stayed alive. So I went to residential school, finished that, and went down to university in Halifax, and my mother was sending me, like, care packages, and I heard throat singing properly, like, you know, on a cassette tape. And I just started throat singing. And it felt like I could have a piece of home with me because I was so lonely. You know, I was sick of the car exhaust. I was sick of people. I was sick of not being able to be myself properly. And it just, 
It's not something like where I was scratching my chin and went, oh, this would be a good idea. It's an actual amalgamation of the cultures that I've been subjected to. Let's hear you do what you do. Um, and just so people know listening, I mean, the, the, the melodic and, um, and gentle voice that they hear now coming out of you, Tanya Tagak, is about to transform. Um, and all of the vocal sounds are made by you, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yeah. This is Tanya Tagak performing live at the World Cafe.
This is Tanya Tagak performing live at the World Cafe. Um, you summon so much when you're in performance like that, or it seems like you're summoning so much. I mean, we hear sounds coming out of you that is hard to attribute to just one singular um, being. So when you're performing um, like you do, what are you thinking of or what are you um, accessing? Well, if I'm going to be totally honest. And please do, yeah. <clears throat> I feel like I'm just finally in reality and this is all fake because mm. we set it up this way as humans we set it up to put all these things on top of ourselves so we can feel terrible <laughs> I don't know it's just it's the freedom of my flesh the f it's freedom it's just freedom yeah and uh i don't like following rules i don't like really <laughs> <laughs> yeah i just find i find it really boring i find um i find i find it boring to kind of hang on to too much uh, there aren't a lot of words in what you do, and yet it's inherently political. Um, mm -hmm. So I suppose I want to know um, what 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 you would like people to think about, or what you would like to incite people to do who are listening to your music. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing, people, uh, a desperate message I'd like to get across, and these are really like all the things I'm saying are like baseline, basic topics that uh, if we had any length of time we could penetrate but uh, as it is right now um, when speaking to mass groups of people I try to keep things um, not as simple as possible but as pure as possible mm -hmm. to, to get the message out and inevitably a lot of people listening will already know all these things right <clears throat> but this continent in order for it to have been taken with slavery and genocide, there had to be a prevailing attitude that uh, people were godless or didn't have a spirit or their cultures were inadequate, that, our, that we were heathen, we were savage, we were dirty, we were stupid, we didn't have technology, we didn't have science, all this stuff. And what this wasn't long ago, this is just a couple generations, and a lot of people are walking through this time right now on this land thinking that that doesn't apply to them, but it's, it's a subconscious social thing that we even carry ourselves as Indigenous people, that we carry every single one of us are living in this society, and the, the dominance is in, has infected all of our thinking so we have to break free from that and it's a deep thing that requires a lot of work and i understand how hard that would be to uh be somebody that's not affected by that subconscious stream of thought thinking it's not there but that that's everyone has work to do Everyone has work to do, but there's certain demographics that are pay paying with our lives. So it's not, uh, you do the work. You do the work. Because we're dying. Just do it. Just do the work. You know, we're doing the work too. It's just time to believe. It's time to, like, believe in uh, equality. Yeah. And it's, especially, it's been, like, it's difficult coming down here to America and like seeing why because it's like immigrants complaining about other immigrants <laughs> you know as an indigenous person it's like what the hell are you doing <laughs> like, you know and I mean you can start uh, tap, tap, tabbing off the racist bingo card now where people are like well everyone's immigrants well uh, it's not when you have villages that are 150,000 years old being discovered in BC it's like now nah, you can't like start talking like that it's there it's and and the saddest thing about this I find is that uh, when when we're being judged 
as Indigenous people, like people accusing me of not paying taxes, for example. And actually I'm paying the same taxes, but we don't get the good health care system. You know, like it's all these like uh, myths that come across uh, that are rooted in fear. And a lot of people understand not understanding how and why we're statistically in this spot. And I don't want to definitely don't want to speak for all people of color. I don't want to speak for all indigenous people. And I don't want to speak for all Inuit. I am an individual coming forth with these ideas or thoughts. And luckily enough, I have a platform. Thank you very much. But it's a, it's just a call to arms for everyone, you know, for everyone. And we're, we're doing our end of the work yeah. as much as we can. Um, in 2016, towards the end of it, you released Retribution um, and found yourself written up about in Rolling Stone and in New York Magazine and in Pitchfork. What does Retribution mean to you? Retribution... <clears throat> Retribution, I named it retribution because Canada keeps touting this idea of reconciliation and it's going way too slow. And it's just different. Like, you know, when you're somebody who is hearing every few weeks of a major tragedy and lives are being lost, it's not like a... It's all this stuff, like the, the stuff being written up and all of this uh, idea of of like fame or success that's kind of second to the main the main thing like I, I feel like there's t there's two things happening one is I love making music and it is protest music but it's not a conscious thing mm. you know but um, and and so there's the joy absolute joy of making music and to be honest I really think I wouldn't be here on the planet if I didn't have that outlet you know, I'm observing something that was is already laying right in front of me, and I'm it's just coming out. Mm. It's strange. It's a really wonderful thing. And when I see people like making music because they want to get famous, I always find it really lame. Like, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if even know if you're allowed to say lame anymore. I think that's a, not a good word. Oh, it might be loaded. Yeah, yeah. But you, you're not into it. Yeah. 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 I'm not into it. Thank you so much for being here, Tanya. <laughs> Welcome. Sorry, I said lame. <laughs> Don't be sorry. Well, then we had a, then we had a lovely learning moment, mm -hmm. and then corrected it. And that's all one can ask oneself to do, huh? Um, thank you so much. You're listening to the World Cafe.